Sarah Watson. Welcome to tonight's show entitled When Lincoln Almost Quit His 1858 Senate Race. This is part of our Looking for Lincoln conversation series. Most historians agree that while Abraham Lincoln lost his attempt to win the Stephen A. Douglas U.S. debate seat from Illinois in 1858, His effort propelled him to the U.S. presidency in 1860. That would not have happened if Lincoln had acted on an impulse he had during that 1858 contest. Lincoln considered quitting the race. Reg Ankrum's interest in Abraham Lincoln led him to Stephen A. Douglas, and Reg is now working on the final volume of his three-volume biography of Douglas. Numerous books, journals, magazines, and newspapers have published more than 100 of Reg's works in historical literature. He speaks frequently on Douglas and Lincoln and antebellum American history. For more information about Looking for Lincoln Conversations, visit the Looking for Lincoln Facebook page. It is now my pleasure to introduce Reg Ankrum. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good to be with you tonight. And I'm, uh, my talk tonight, will take about 35 to 40 minutes. So uh, relax, enjoy it. And uh, what I would say particularly is watch for those things that place demand after demand after demand on Abraham Lincoln. So we get started. His friends and colleagues might agree with the observation of his law partner, William Herndon, that Abraham Lincoln was a little engine that knew no rest. But by September 1858, the Illinois Republican Party's U.S. Senate candidate, Abraham Lincoln, was tiring. Unlike his opponent, Stephen A. Douglas, who could rely on the favors of friends and a statewide Democratic Party that Douglas himself had created, and which had boosted his ever-rising political career for more than 25 years, Abe Lincoln had campaigned for political office only once, since the end of his single term in Congress nearly a decade earlier. The Republican Party in Illinois, only four years old by 1858, had little infrastructure. Lincoln could not match the political and financial resources, and more importantly, the reputation of the man he had challenged for the U.S. Senate in 1858. Lincoln would serve as his own campaign manager, and the intellectual and physical demands of his constricted campaign were exhausting. Speeches, sometimes two a day, typically ran two hours. Some lasted three, some four. Through some of them, Lincoln would have to struggle under the humidity and heat of the Illinois summer sun and autumn storms and swelter. He frequently was called upon to amend his canvas's schedule to satisfy requests for appearances from supporters to avoid offending them. That meant additional correspondence to rearrange transportation and schedules. Accommodations often were inhospitable. So were his opponent's supporters who showed up wherever Lincoln went. In Jacksonville, near the end of September, 1858, Illinois College President Julian Monson Sturdivant met Lincoln at the Great Western Railroad Station on the east side of town. Sturdivant was alarmed by Lincoln's appearance. To a question from his fellow Republican, Abe Lincoln admitted that he was tired and had thought of quitting the race. Abraham Lincoln had launched his campaign to unseat U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas at the state capitol in Springfield on June 16, 1858. It was a speech that even his closest friends and family considered ill-advised. With his House Divided speech, Lincoln, at the opening of his campaign, limited himself by casting it in moral absolutes. The address would make slavery the sole issue of the campaign. His campaign was to focus on the evidence Lincoln saw of a conspiracy to enshrine slavery throughout the Union. He spoke of Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, Douglas's bill to organize Kansas and Nebraska, repealed the geographic line that for 34 years had limited slavery to the area below the baseline of the state of Missouri. Intending to stop congressional interventions in slavery, 
Douglas replaced the Missouri Compromise line with popular sovereignty. His principle was to give to those who had a stake in their domestic institutions, and not Congress, the right to decide on them. Lincoln, on the other hand, feared that popular sovereignty would open all the states and territories to slavery. He spoke next of the U.S. Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision of 1857. For the first time, the court ruled that the Negro in the United States had no rights whites were bound to respect, and it ruled that Congress had no authority to prevent slavery from a territory. Finally, Lincoln took notice of President James Buchanan's pressure to admit Kansas as a state under a fraudulent Lecompton Constitution, which, despite his promise to let the people of the Kansas Territory decide themselves whether to permit slavery, would have guaranteed slavery in Kansas. Abraham Lincoln saw in these actions a democratic conspiracy that involved the Chief Justice, the President, and his 1858 opponent, U.S. Senator Stephen A. Douglas, to spread slavery throughout the Union. Lincoln put it this way, we shall lie down pleasantly dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free, and we shall awake to the reality instead that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. Lincoln sought to restore the principle that gave the party shape two years earlier. He read his House Divided speech to friends that afternoon, and they advised him not to make it. Leonard Sweat of Bloomington observed that at the beginning of the campaign, nothing could have been more unfortunate or inappropriate. The speech also upset Mary Lincoln's relatives, the Edwardses, as well as Lincoln's first law partner, her cousin, John Todd Stewart. Stewart warned that it was incendiary and unnecessary and did nothing to benefit Lincoln's campaign. After all, the state's Republicans in convention just that afternoon had nominated him their first and only choice for the Senate. He need not be so inflammatory. Yet Lincoln was concerned about a dilution of party doctrine that was evident in the flirtation of some influential Republicans, New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley among them, with the idea of making Douglas the Republican candidate. Douglas's battle with fellow Democrat President Buchanan over the Lecompton Constitution made him an outcast among Buchanan Democrats. If Douglas bolted from them, he could be expected to take large numbers of Democrats with him. It made him an attractive candidate for Republicans. Although they were not friends of Greeley, New York political boss Thurlow Weed and U.S. Senator William Seward saw advantage in eliminating Lincoln, who some viewed as a rival to Stewart for the presidency in 1860. That was demonstrated at the Republican National Convention in 1856. Lincoln finished second among 15 nominees for the party's first national ticket. <clears throat> Weed and Seward believed that a Douglas defection would end the democracy as a national party and help assure the fulfillment of Seward's own ambition for the presidency in 1860. It would eliminate competition from Lincoln. Douglas also was viewed as a moderate alternative to some Republicans who feared their new party was veering toward abolitionism. With these developments, Lincoln had grown concerned about the dulling of public opinion over the differences between Douglas and himself. His house divided speech was designed to sharpen the focus on those differences, to draw a clear distinction between the political and moral beliefs of Judge Douglas and himself. Lincoln wanted to remind his listeners of the legacy of the founders, that their aim had been to place slavery on a path to ultimate extinction. Douglas's popular sovereignty, Lincoln said, had changed the calculus by enabling slavery's expansion. As the campaign progressed, Lincoln could conclude that his friend's advice against the speech was probably correct. With it, he had set a course by which he admitted that he seemed not to control events, but was controlled by them. Douglas would see to that. He would force Lincoln again and again to explain House Divided. He would vex Lincoln by repeatedly charging that Lincoln had demonstrated he wanted to make the nation all one thing or all the other. Renowned for twisting words in a way that could make a horse chestnut, 
a chestnut horse, as Lincoln said in his first debate with Douglas at Ottawa. Douglas now sought to disturb the political sensitivities of his fellow Illinoisans. The House divided speech he charged agitated even further the strained relations between North and South and would change the nature of government by replacing state sovereignty with a new national uniformity. Douglas's attacks were bound in strong argument and Lincoln would be pestered into answering them over and over throughout the campaign. At numerous stops along the campaign's itinerary, he expressed frustration that Douglas kept forcing him to answer the same questions again and again. The frustration was over more than repetition, though. Douglas's questions would require a fine line in Lincoln's logic and would expose a weakness in it, either a pandering to the prejudices of an audience, as Douglas had suggested, or an undercurrent of Lincoln's own apparent racism. When Douglas earlier had construed that Lincoln's view of the Declaration of Independence meant blacks would be perfectly equal to whites, Lincoln rejoined that blacks were unequal in some respects. In fact, even free, they would continue to be unequal in social and political respects, Lincoln acknowledged. Quote, there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. I do not understand that because I do not want a Negro woman for a slave, I must necessarily want her for a wife. My understanding is that I can just let her alone. Douglas attacked such declarations in Charleston as disingenuous. He accused Lincoln of saying one thing in Southern Illinois and another in Central and Northern Illinois. Lincoln recognized that Illinois was a microcosm of the nation from abolition to bondage, and he was walking a tight rope he had called on Douglas to detour from it. Let us discard all this quibbling, a troubled Lincoln had said in a speech in Chicago, answering Douglas's of the day before, about this man and the other man, this race and that race and the other race being inferior. Let us discard all these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. Fearful that Douglas was gaining the upper hand in the debates, Lincoln's supporters urged him to be more forceful. John Mathers, a prominent Jacksonville brick manufacturer and that city's first mayor, encouraged Lincoln in a letter to take the offensive. Lincoln agreed and confirmed to Mathers that he would take off the gloves. Your suggestions as to placing oneself on the offensive rather than the defensive are certainly correct, Lincoln answered. That is a point I shall not disregard. <clears throat> Lincoln had burdened himself with creating his strategy for campaigning in the nearly 57,000 square mile state of Illinois. In July, he mapped his plan based on the 1856 election results in Illinois to determine the areas of strength and weaknesses in his candidacy. It was painstaking research. Members of the General Assembly elected Illinois' U.S. Senators in that day. That's the reason that Lincoln studied district by district the votes in the 1856 presidential race, and the race for state treasurer. His notes filled eight pages. He analyzed the vote in each legislative district of the state to determine where voters were likely to be for or against him. In his own Sangamon County, presidential candidates John C. Fremont, Republican, and Millard Fillmore, Whig American, whose voters Lincoln expected he could attract, won a total of 2,700 votes to 2,400 votes for the Democrat Buchanan. That was, Lincoln wrote, 311 votes net for us. On the other hand, in Sangamon County, Democratic Treasurer nominee John Moore beat Republican James Miller 2,600 votes to 2,400 votes. That's 147 net against us, Lincoln noted. Using the Moore and Miller results, Lincoln calculated that he could win legislators' votes in 39 of the 58 
House districts. He believed he would have to struggle for six more districts to win Douglas's Senate seat. He would work in those districts hard, making more than 40 of his 60 speeches in them. These tedious calculations, which Lincoln would know that Douglas and his campaign committee had considered just as much, were frequently on his mind as he conducted his canvass. Through the early summer of his campaign, Lincoln was preoccupied with work on several legal cases he had undertaken in the previous year. He did not let the campaign interfere with his standard that he owed his law clients his best efforts. A good number of court appearances required his attention during the first two months of the campaign. In June, he had to decline an invitation to be at the Clinton County Republican Convention, which started the day after the beginning of the U.S. District Court summer session. He appeared 10 times for clients before Judge Samuel Treat in that U.S. District Court in Springfield and several more in Illinois Circuit and Supreme Courts. It meant that it was August before he was able to devote his full attention to the campaign. It also meant that Douglas had a two-month head start in the contest. Lincoln grew increasingly alarmed when several of his friends and former Whigs affiliated themselves with Douglas's party. The Democratic press noticed those moves too, and especially the move from, by John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's mentor, his first law partner, and his wife's cousin, to the party of Douglas. Others to stray included James Singleton of Quincy and Usher Linder of Charleston, influential Whig lawyers on either side of the state, who could be expected to take with them some of Lincoln's all-important central Illinois electorate. Most unnerving was the blow that came when Lincoln's friend, Judge Theophilus Dickey of Ottawa, arranged for a letter from Kentucky Senator John J. Crittenden endorsing Douglas to be circulated throughout Illinois near the end of the campaign. It was a blow that Lincoln believed was largely responsible for his loss to Douglas. <clears throat> From the beginning of the campaign, Lincoln was aware that Douglas was wrapped in a national reputation, and Lincoln was not. But he believed he had a surefire way to combat Douglas without retort. Simply follow him around the state, and on the day after Douglas addressed his, his audiences, answer him point by point. Lincoln's supporters considered that good strategy. Douglas, though, was annoyed by the challenger riding his coattails. So was the press that was partial to him. Douglas's friends at the Chicago Times accused Lincoln of having to follow his opponent because he was unable to attract his own supporters. The paper suggested that Lincoln join a circus so he could secure audiences. It was enough to embarrass Abe Lincoln, who, over the next several days, notified Republicans around the state by letter that he would no longer follow Douglas as planned. That meant he would have to interrupt an already hectic schedule, take the time to rearrange dates and logistics for speeches that he had planned to make in several communities. Getting from one place to another in a state nearly 400 miles long and 200 miles wide was just as trying physically for Lincoln, who nearly always arranged his own travel. And Lincoln intensified these difficulties by adding appearances to his schedule with little regard for the quality of transportation or comfort. He calculated that voters were more important than the conditions he faced to get to them. At each location, local committees arranged events. They rarely considered the impact on Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's train from McCone arrived from, for his sixth debate with Douglas at Quincy, for example, at 9.30 on the morning of Wednesday, October 18th, 1858. That was less than five hours before the Quincy debate was to begin. Douglas had lived six years in Quincy and had been elected by the region's voters to Congress in 1843. They re-elected him in 1844 and again in 1846. And in 1847, the Illinois General Assembly promoted him to the U.S. Senate. Douglas arrived at 9.50 p.m. the night before the Quincy debate in the luxury of a private coach provided by the Illinois Central Railroad. After a torchlight procession and dinner with friends, the senator spent the night at the lavish Quincy House Hotel just across Main Street from Washington Park where the debate would be staged 
the next afternoon. Lincoln had expected to relax at the home of his friends, Orville and Eliza Browning, before the debate. But Quincy lawyer Abraham Jonas had planned a large and elaborate Republican welcome. Jonas was as committed a Lincoln man as any there was. It was in his law office that his partner, Henry Asbury, had suggested to Horace Greeley two years earlier that Lincoln should be the Republican Party's presidential nominee in 1860. And it was at this time that Asbury suggested to Lincoln four questions for use in his debates, including the famous Freeport question, which could turn Southern votes away from Douglas. Can the people of the United States territory in any lawful way, against the wish of any citizen of the United States, exclude slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution? The question greatly annoyed Douglas. He had answered it any number of times. Yes, if people of a territory could vote for or against slavery, then they had the power to turn it down. Contrary to historians' views that Douglas's admission cost him greatly, it did not. He was already well known for his opposition to admitting Kansas into the Union as a slave state. He had fought no less than the President of the United States, James Buchanan, over the matter. The President and the South wanted Kansas to come in with a constitutional guarantee of slavery. Douglas assured that would not happen. The Quincy Whig alerted readers that Jonas and his committee invited Republicans to join an elaborate reception they had organized for Lincoln's arrival. Thousands responded, marching in a parade that took two hours, after which Lincoln was escorted to Lawyer Browning's home. There, Adams County Republican women welcomed their guest, Abe Lincoln, with a large bouquet of flowers and lunch. Oddly, the event's host was absent. Orville Browning, who tended to look down on Lincoln over his rising reputation, chose to be elsewhere that day. Browning's now famous diary barely mentions that Lincoln and Douglas were in Quincy to debate that day. Lincoln and Douglas got an unexpected half hour rest, waiting while workers repaired a bench that had collapsed under the weight of several women. Three were injured. At 2.30 p.m., the debate began Lincoln spoke for 60 minutes, Douglas for 90, and Lincoln for 30 more. A month earlier, Lincoln took the steamboat Sam Gaddy from Naples to Beardstown, Illinois River communities, on the morning of August 12th to begin campaigning intensively. Douglas had spoken there the day before. The local Lincoln committee had planned to announce their candidate's arrival by firing the same cannon that Democrats had used to welcome Douglas. The Republicans discovered that the Democrats had plugged the cannon with bricks and mortar to make it inoperable for Lincoln's welcome. On Thursday, September 16th, Lincoln and Whig friend Henry Whitney of Urbana attended the Centralia Agricultural Fair. Douglas had been there too, although neither spoke during the day. That night, Lincoln and Whitney waited at the Illinois Central Railroad Station for the train due in around midnight that would take them to Mattoon. From there, they would go on to nearby Charleston for Lincoln's fourth debate with Douglas on Saturday. By design, the Democrats did not make it easy for Lincoln. The station was full of waiting passengers, even at midnight, an arrangement by Douglas Democrats to intrude on Lincoln's efforts to, steal it to sleep. When the train arrived, other passengers boarded first and filled the seats, leaving no place for Lincoln to rest. Whitney learned that there was a saloon at the in, saloon car at the end of the train that was empty but locked. When he asked the conductor to allow Lincoln to rest in it, the conductor refused. Whitney, who was a lawyer for the railroad company, reminded the conductor of his position, and Lincoln was able to use the saloon car for sleep that evening. The railroad line's vice president, George B. McClellan, a Democrat, had provided an especially luxurious car on a train for Douglas and accompanied him on the trip to Charleston. The Douglas train was given special treatment, which included putting any other train, including the ones Lincoln rode, on sidings at which they had to wait for the Douglas train to pass. While campaigning, 
Lincoln attended nearly 20 separate political meetings from conferences with individual local politicians to county Republican conventions. For friendly candidates who expressed doubts about their chances, Lincoln was a demanding coach. When John Bagby, a fellow Kentucky native who moved to Rushville in 1846 to practice law, seemed dejected in his candidacy for office, Lincoln wrote tersely, Mr. Hatch tells me you write rather in a discouraged tone as to your own election. That won't do. You must be elected. Must is the word. By all means, don't say, if I can, say, I will. As for his own demeanor, Lincoln was known by friends not to follow that advice. They knew of a strain of melancholia, which Lincoln called his hypos, that could deeply darken the man's spirits. At one hour, he could be surrounded by a group of lawyers looking into the eyes that flashed with fun and listening to Lincoln's well-worn yarns that had the power to invoke laughter from even the haughtiest of them. Later that same evening, however, he might be found sitting alone in a chair tipped against a wall of an empty room, no longer brilliant or merry, but sad and downcast, his hands clasped about his knees. In moody silence and abstraction, he had thrown about him a barrier so dense and impenetrable, no one dared to break through. A Douglas stratagem about which, about which Lincoln learned in July cast him into just such a state. In a note written July 8, 1858, Herndon described his partner's darkening mood. Mr. Lincoln was here a moment ago and told me that he had just seen Colonel Darty and had a conversation with him. Darty told Lincoln that the national democracy, Douglas's party, intended to run in every county and district a national Democrat for each and every office. Mr. Lincoln replied, if you do this, the thing is settled. Lincoln is very certain as to Miller's and Bateman's election on the state ticket, but is gloomy and rather uncertain about his own success. The pressures of planning and speaking, the distances traveled, days of stark sun and heat and wrenching humidity that could turn quickly to cold and rain, constant attention of the admiring and the not so admiring, costs of campaigning that would have to be repaid. None of it was easy for either man. Douglas, too, had been severely strained by the campaign. On September 27th, a large crowd gathered at 7 a.m. in Springfield's town square to escort Lincoln three blocks east to the Great Western Railroad Station. A number of them would join him for the trip to Jacksonville, about 25 miles directly west, it was in Jacksonville that the seeds of the new Republican Party had been planted. The National Whig Party had been irreparably damaged by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Paul Selby, a leading Illinois abolitionist and editor of the Morgan Journal of Jacksonville, organized a meeting of Whig newspaper editors at Decatur in February 1856 to discuss formation of a new anti-slavery party in Illinois. At Selby's invitation, Abraham Lincoln was the only non-editor to attend. He drafted the resolutions the editors ratified at Decatur, including one that called for a state convention at Bloomington. The following May, the state's first Republican Party was organized there. Lincoln's train arrived in Jacksonville at 11 a.m. on that September 27, 1858, and Julian Sturdivant was in the large crowd that greeted him. Sturdivant had admired Lincoln from their first meeting. They were kindred spirits in their hatred of slavery. The first vote Sturdivant cast in a national presidential election in 1848 had been for the free soil candidate, Martin Van Buren. He was disappointed that anti-slavery principles lost and equally disappointed two years later when the Compromise of 1850 quelled another Southern threat of secession but did not move the nation any closer to end slavery. Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska bill four years later offered Sturdivant even less reason for hope. Like Edward Beecher, his predecessor at the college, Sturdivant was an abolitionist. Unlike Beecher, whose publicly held anti-slavery views had forced his return east, Sturdivant was more sensitive to the culture and politics of the Jacksonville community, which had been founded largely by Southern immigrants two decades later, two decades earlier, Sturdivant furthered his abolitionist goals 
more discreetly. Lincoln had been to Jacksonville dozens of times over the 20 years before his senatorial campaign. He visited young New Salem men, students there at Illinois College, like David Rutledge, son of the New Salem tavern keeper and brother of Lincoln's first love, Ann Rutledge. Lincoln's Illinois College friends inducted him, an honorary member of two men's literary societies there. A few of them would serve in President Lincoln's administration in years ahead. These visits drew Sturdivant close to Lincoln. Long before he was thought of as a candidate for the presidency, I knew him intimately, Sturdivant wrote in his autobiography. He stood in the foremost rank among the most truth-loving men I have ever known. If you could reach the very center of his mental activity, you would always find there some more truth from which everything radiated. Lincoln and Jacksonville's Richard Yates, the first graduate of Illinois College, now a lawyer, and soon to be Illinois' wartime governor were Whig friends who had discussed how a blow might be struck against slavery under the law. Sturdivant remembered his first sighting of Lincoln at a speech to some 2,000 people in Morgan County. He spoke guardedly, proposing to confine slavery within its existing limits. He sought to move his audience to prevent the further extension of slavery. That day, I first learned that Abraham Lincoln was a great man. <clears throat> Sturdivant was faithful, was faithful to Lincoln and his cause. Men of Lincoln's caliber gave Sturdivant hope that slavery's ultimate extinction might be achieved. Sturdivant had involved himself in Lincoln's senatorial, senatorial campaign from its start. He had been at the State House in Springfield on the evening of June 16th and heard Lincoln deliver his House Divided speech. Unlike most of those in the group who had listened to it that afternoon from the State House Library, Sturdivant believed the speech one of the greatest he had ever heard. He recalled that Democrats paraded noisily outside the State House as Lincoln spoke that summer evening in an attempt to disrupt him. But Sturdivant said the audience was too engaged by the power of Lincoln's language to be distracted. I shall never forget my emotions as the tall form of our leader rose before us, and he gave utterance to the memorable words. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect that it will cease to be divided. It will become all the one thing or all the other. Sturdivant believed no statesman had more wisely chosen the ground he was to stand on, define it more boldly, or defend it more irresistibly. He had not only followed Lincoln's progress in the 1858 campaign, he assisted in launching it. The Illinois College president was the first of two men to speak on August 12th at Beardstown before Lincoln delivered a two-hour address, his first as he turned his full attention to his senatorial campaign. Douglas had spoken there the day before. At Beardstown, whose incorporation bill Lincoln had sponsored as a legislator during a special session in 1835, the orders of the campaign began. From there, he reboarded the Sam Gaddy to travel upriver for a speech at Havana. He boarded another steamboat for a two-hour speech at Bath, the town he had laid out in 1836 when assistant Sangamon County surveyor. From there, he returned to Havana, where he took a carriage to Lewistown and a speech to more than 6,000 who waited for him there. He rode on to Peoria, where he attended the 4th District Republican Convention that morning and spoke that afternoon. As he began his talk, heavy showers interrupted, scattering the crowd and moving Lincoln into a nearby hall to finish in front of a diminished audience. After a visit with local political leaders, he boarded a northbound train for Morris to spend the night before leaving the next morning for the first great debate with Douglas at Ottawa on August 21st. Five weeks after he had begun with Link he had been with Lincoln at Beardstown, Sturdivant saw a noticeably different Lincoln when he arrived in Jacksonville on that September 27th. Lincoln was to speak in Jacksonville that afternoon, then speak twice in nearby Winchester over the next two days. The thin, white-haired and bearded Sturdivant walked with Lincoln to his hotel a few blocks away. He was alarmed by Lincoln's gaunt, gaunt and drained appearance and mentioned it to the campaigner. Mr. Lincoln, you must be having a weary time. 
Lincoln's answer was blunt. I am, he said, and if it were not for one thing, I would retire from the contest. I know that if Mr. Douglas's doctrine prevails, it will not be 15 years before Illinois itself will be a slave state. Sturdivant believed that Lincoln's fear about the spread of slavery, as he thought Douglas's doctrine portended, haunted Lincoln, had made him careworn, but indeed was the only thing that kept him in the race. So keenly did he feel that slavery must be arrested before it subjugated the whole nation, said Sturdivant. It was this conviction that impelled him. Lincoln's response about his exhaustion had not been flip. In Quincy, three weeks later, he complained to George Floyd, owner of the Farmer's Hotel, that he was so near exhaustion, he thought he would have to quit the race and give up completely. Lincoln's schedule during the remaining month of campaigning was no less demanding. That September afternoon after his walk with Sturdivant, Lincoln delivered his speech in Jacksonville. The next day, he was slow to get up. He got, he got up late, got a late start, and rode a borrowed horse hard to catch up with the delegation that had been arranged to escort him to Winchester. E.F. Lamolino, one of the escorts from Jacksonville, told a reporter with the Illinois State Journal that when Lincoln caught up, his horse was white with sweat and Lincoln black with dust. Lincoln spoke in Winchester, where Douglas had remained popular, having taught school in the largely Democratic community after his arrival in Illinois in 1833. After the speech, Lincoln attended a large barbecue in his honor. The next day, he spent hours in the law office of John Moses, thumbing through several copies of the Congressional Globe, then spoke at the courthouse that evening in Winchester. Abe Lincoln spent two nights in Winchester at the appropriately named Haggard Hotel. He was befriended by Rosa and Lenny Haggard, young daughters of the proprietor. He wrote a poem for each girl. His poem to Lenny was fanciful. A sweet plaintive song did I hear, and I fancied that she was the singer. May emotions as pure as that song set astir be the worst that the future shall bring her. But in the lines to Rosa, there were shadows of a more despairing Lincoln about whom Julian Sturdivant had been so concerned. In Rosa's autograph album, Lincoln wrote, to Rosa, you are young and I am older. You are hopeful, I am not. Enjoy life, ere it grow colder. Pluck the roses, ere they rot. Teach your bow to heed the lay that sunshine soon is lost in shade. That now's as good as any day to take thee, Rosa, ere she fade. Abraham Lincoln. The next day, a group of Winchester citizens escorted Lincoln to the Illinois River's Edge at Florence, where Republicans from Pike County met him, ferried him across the river, and took him to Pittsfield, where he spoke to a crowd of thousands for two hours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reg. That was wonderful. And now it's time to... Um for you to ask your questions. If you have not done so, please type them in the chat or in the comment section, and we will get through as many questions as time allows. And we already have several really good questions in the chat, Reg. So we'll get, we will get started right away. All right, so here's your first question. What was Lincoln's professional relationship with Douglas like outside of campaigning for the 1858 Senate race? as well as the 1860 presidential election. I think there was th really throughout their 26 years in which Lincoln pursued Douglas politically, there was a friendship. I don't think it was close, but they met frequently in towns within Illinois, uh, certainly in Springfield where Douglas and Lincoln uh, moved on just about the same time. Lincoln moved to Springfield in April of 1837. Douglas had moved there in March of 1837. So they had the same associates, the same friends. Um, they would debate for hours on end in the back of Joshua Speed's store in Springfield, Lincoln, Douglas, and their Democratic and Whig friends. 
And even after uh, Douglas was elected to Congress, they were friends. Lincoln asked favors of Douglas for appointments. Um, at, in one, at one time, asked Senator Douglas to write a letter for his son, uh, Robert, who was unable to get into Harvard because he scored too low on a couple of tests. Douglas wrote a letter to Harvard at Lincoln's request, and Robert was admitted then to Harvard uh, as a result. So they, they were friendly on a professional basis. It was like other politicians. Uh, they, they usually were on opposing sides of political issues, but that really didn't uh, dissuade their friendship on a personal basis. Uh, their friends were the same, and they, they really circulated among the same parties and, and events. Okay. Thank you. All right. So here's your next question. Um, it sounds like Lincoln was totally exhausted from the ordeal. How likely was it that he would actually have quit the race? And I think you kind of answered that at the end of your talk, but um, would you like to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, uh, he, it was on his mind without any question. Twice he talked about it to people who actually wrote about it, Story of it in his autobiography. And that's where the where I read that sentence that floored me because I'd never known he had thought about quitting the race. And then in Quincy, um, George Floyd had a, uh, was the owner of the farmer's hotel. And I think it was the Atlantic magazine at the time wrote the story of Floyd. And uh, when Lincoln stayed with Floyd at that hotel saying he wanted to quit the race um, as Lincoln told Sturdivant, he considered it, but he said the one thing that stopped him from doing it was the one thing by which he had to con he had to continue, and that was his belief that if he didn't fight it, Douglas would make slavery expand through the territories and the states of the nation. So he didn't feel as though he could quit for any reason, whether he was tired or not. And it was clear. I hope I made the point that he was so exhausted the 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 way he had to plan his own transportation. He would rearrange schedules. Uh, he had to investigate. Uh, you know, precinct uh, charges of fraudulent votes and so on and so forth, which I didn't put in the speech. But I mean, he was constantly derided by uh, Douglas supporters, uh, weather, climate conditions. So yeah, I, I could just, as I was writing, I could just sense how tiring and exhausting that campaign was for him. It was exhausting for Douglas too. Douglas himself was exhausted. He said that, but he obviously would never quit any race. Yeah. All right. So here's, um, I kind of actually kind of goes with what you just said. Were there any pushbacks by Lincoln or his supporters or Lincoln his supporters about the tactics used by Douglas people to inhibit Lincoln's movements between debates? Well, um, I, I can't say that I know of any specifics. I, I know that, uh, Douglas supporters made it tough. I mean, that was another part of, you know, the, the exhaustion that Lincoln faced, um, but whether whether uh, Lincoln supporters push back in any real way, I'm not sure. I've re not read anything that there were any kind of physical altercations among them, but typically until the great debates, uh, they were debating on separate days. Uh, there were a couple times, you know, like the agricultural uh, event in Springfield during their period. But mo for the most part, Douglas would speak on one day and Lincoln would follow up on the other day, or they had individual uh, speeches. And it was only during the great debates where they were together uh, speaking one right after another uh, with a few exceptions to that. So there weren't really too many times where, you know, um, opposing uh, parties were in the same location at the same time where something could have happened, I suppose. Okay. Um, here's your next question. We have lots of really good questions coming in. Good. All right. Does, uh, does Decatur, Illinois or Ripon, Wisconsin have mm -hmm. the better case for being the birthplace of the Republican party? Well, obviously it was Ripon, Wisconsin. Uh, they, th it was short. I think it was the middle of 1854. You know, the Kansas Nebraska act is passed and signed in May of 1854. And it may have been July or August when, Whigs in Ripon, Wisconsin, got together to try to create this new party, and they actually uh, that they actually gave it Jefferson's name Repub to the Republican, you know, Republican Party. Um, the the uh, the Illinois Party was actually formed in 1856. Okay. In yeah. All right. Here's your next question. Mm 
Um, wasn't Lincoln really being two-faced as Douglas charged in his open remarks at Charleston? Well, I mean, the, my talk, I think, did point that out. But one should also point out that Douglas said the same thing. It was it was not culturally offensive to say such things. And, you know, um, both men use the N-word, Lincoln not as often as Douglas in speeches, in, in the debates, but it was common. Um, Lincoln was fighting two issues. He had to appeal to those who might join him, and he had to find a way to do that without offending them by, you know, indicating that he was an abolitionist. He never claimed to be an abolitionist. His buddy Julian Sturdivant did, uh, but Lincoln didn't. He was anti-slavery. And so he never, uh, you know, he was never on the side of the constitution burning people like William Lloyd Garrison, who said, you know, the nation is violating every principle of humanity there is. Uh, he was more interested in trying to reach the point where the founders had put us, you know, it was actually the founders who, you know, who built a slave constitution because they had to. The South demanded a slave slavery be in the Constitution, or they wouldn't uh, approve the Constitution. And so they accepted a slave Constitution. Uh, Lincoln was much in the, in the line of George Washington, who was asked about slavery in the Constitution. Washington said, I wish we could have had a better document, but it was the best we could do at the time. And he did say that we have provided for an amendatory process by which it sometime will end. And that's the standard that George Washington, the founder, set and the standard that Lincoln agreed to. Lincoln called it his own standard maxim. Uh, you know, the, the, the elimination of slavery is the ideal. We can't get there all at once, but we can we have a duty and a moral obligation to continue to try. And so that's where Lincoln came from on that issue. OK, so I'm going to group two questions together because they're very similar. So I'm going to ask you both, but they're, I think you can probably get the same answer. So the first one is did either candidate have any staff? And then the other one is, did Lincoln have a campaign manager as we might know the position or was he completely on his own followed by, did Douglas have like a campaign manager? Yeah, um, let me answer the Lincoln one first. No, Lincoln did not have a campaign manager. And, and in fact, that's part of the reason he was so exhausted. He really had to do a lot of things himself. And even those who were helpful to him, um, were in a sense harmful to him because like in Quincy, when he got here, he expected five hours before the debate, expected to go to Browning's house to rest. And his good friend Orville or uh, Abraham Jonas had a big reception committee, uh, it took two hours of parading. And by the time they were done with it, Lincoln had just a couple of hours to spend getting that bouquet of flowers and lunch. I love that. I love the word, the way the, way the ladies use it, lunch, Mr. Lincoln. Uh, anyway, in Quincy. So that was the problem for Lincoln. Douglas's, Douglas really had no actual manager. He was able to do it himself, but he assigned tasks along the way. He had people who would work in this community or that community to get everything set up. So all Douglas had to do was just show up. And he had the, uh, he had the patronage of people like George McClellan, who became the great, not so great general under President Lincoln, uh, McClellan being a graduate of West Point. Uh, but in any case, had his patronage and, you know, McClellan said whatever he needs as, as far as transportation and rails around the, the ICC would provide it. Douglas actually provided the way for the ICC's construction. So he was very much appreciated. And so to answer your question, Douglas really had no manager, but he had a lot of people managing at those locations when he was speaking. Okay. So here's your next question. Do you know if Mary Lincoln knew Lincoln wished to quit? And if so, what do you think her action would have been? That's a, yeah. that's some speculation thrown in there, Reg. <laughs> it is. Um, let me just say this. I, I guess it's speculation. There's no doubt in my mind that she knew he was weary. You know, he from there were a few times that he got back to Springfield. He was gone a lot, but he did get back. And my thought is that, she, you know, Lincoln ran once before in 1855 for the Senate position, and and Mary Mary Todd Lincoln was very much um, interested in in what was happening and uh, influential about what was happening. And unfortunately, he lost to Lyman Trumbull, and her best friend 
Mary Lincoln never spoke to again. That was Lyman Trumbull's wife. So she was very persuasive in that regard. Um, I, I think she, you know, from that situation, she, she you know, she, she was very interested in Lincoln uh, succeeding. I, I think she would have tried to persuade him. I can't say that I know, or we can't speculate that she did, but it seems to me uh, she would have been persuasive in that regard. I think Lincoln himself wouldn't have quit simply because, as he said, the one thing that the one thing that Douglas talked about kept Lincoln in the race, and that was the possible the possibility of the expansion of slavery, which Douglas did not anticipate. By the way, just to point out, Douglas believed that that great Mexican session, which he had resolved four years earlier, all the states that were coming in, Douglas told the South, you better be aware that these will all come in free states. And he was right. They all did, with one exception. That was Utah. But or, but California immediately came in a free state. Oregon came in a free state. Arizona, New Mexico, and other states that were territories as they became states were coming in free. So Douglas was right about that. And I'd say, okay. finally, that he was proud of his own state of Illinois that in 1824 tried to become a slave state under the equal footing provision of the Constitution, which means any state has the right to any institutions the 13 original states did, had, and they all had slavery. Uh, Vermont gave theirs up in 1777. But anyway, uh, Douglas was proud that Illinoisans turned off the idea of slavery in, in his own state of Illinois. Okay, thank you. All right, here's your next question. Um, and it has to do with McClellan. So huh? they were they were interested in the foreshadowing of McClellan and Lincoln's relationship during the Civil War. So they kind of want to know, did Lincoln know that like McClellan at this time? And did he know that, you know, McClellan had arranged for Douglas to have the special car and that type of thing? So could you yes. speak to like McClellan and Lincoln's relationship before he was president of the United States? Yes. Uh, Lincoln and McClellan were acquainted. McClellan had started out with the uh, ICC um, almost from its beginning as a young engineer. At that time, West Point was simply training engineers. They really didn't train men for other kinds of commanding. Uh, it, was, it was an engineering institution. And so McClellan was a trained engineer. He gets hired by the Illinois Central Railroad uh, as an engineer makes his way very quickly, was a vice president uh, in 1858, and, and he called the shots for Douglas. He was a Democrat. And uh, so Lincoln, who actually practiced law, part of his law practice uh, was for the Illinois Central Railroad. That's where he met Henry Whitney, who I mentioned uh, was with him at Charleston when, uh, when um, uh, the Democrats tried to keep Lincoln from getting any sleep. So yes, he, Lincoln and McClellan were acquainted well before the Civil War started. Okay. Well, that's a fun tidbit that probably most people don't know, that McClellan knew Lincoln and Lincoln knew McClellan yeah. before the Civil War. We always think of yeah. him at the Civil War. Okay. So we have gotten through all of the questions, and there were a lot of really good questions. They were good. Um, so I'm going to ask you the question we always ask as we wrap up tonight's broadcast, which is, why do you think we should still study about Abraham Lincoln in the 21st century? Well, uh, it, in my estimation, Lincoln is our, if we have any saints in this country, uh, my civil saint, or I would uh, carry the carry the water for the civil sainthood of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, here's a young man, uh, you know, a guy born to nothing. Uh, his father actually was actually run off two farms and they were hard scrabble farms. They were tough to farm. But anyway, he start off, starts off with nothing. He is self-educated. Um, he is very much influenced by the foundations of this country, uh, both in the sense of, of uh, the wisdom of its founders, um, the, philosophy, the philosophical ways that the country was founded, particularly the Declaration of Independence, the great moral document that he believed wholeheartedly in and the constitution of laws, which he also believed in. And he, he saw a problem, um, you know, self-educated himself. He only had a total of nine months of what he called blab schools. They were like learn, wrote schools uh, by repetition and, and uh, mathematics, uh, to cite, as he said, I could cipher to the rule of three. But so he was self-trained, self-educated, uh, 
and probably one of the most brilliant, beautiful writers. I mean, you know, England has its Shakespeare, its its um, Samuel Johnson, its other great uh, Chaucer and so on and so forth. We have a lot of great writers too, but the early writer that I love is Abraham Lincoln. You read his literature, you read the second inaugural, inaugural address, uh, fragments that he wrote to himself, uh, an elegant writer. So uh, he, he is certainly, and and ultimately set us, changed the nature of government. We, he, he did create the rebirth of the nation in, in, uh, emanci in the Emancipation Proclamation. And without Abraham Lincoln, we might still have slavery in this country. Um, and I'll finish it by pointing this out that people may not know. There were actually two 13th Amendments introduced in the Congress. The first was introduced right at the beginning of the Civil War. That 13th Amendment called for the Constitution um, to have an amendment that would make slavery permanent in this country and make it, and, and the second part of it was, it was an unamendable uh, amendment. So that would have meant slavery would not have ended in this country, but by revolution, which we actually had anyway, uh, shortly, even while that was done. And believe it or not, there were five states, Illinois being the first, that ratified that first 13th Amendment. Lincoln pushed strongly for the second 13th Amendment, which was introduced by his friend and others, Lyman Trumbull of Illinois, and it passed. And of course, we finally ended slavery. It's taken a long time to get out from under the vestiges and what remains of, you know, mistreatment of human beings. But, but uh, for me, Abraham Lincoln is worth studying forever for what he, for, for the great model he gives us for humanity. Yeah. And I will just add for those who do not know, Illinois was the first state to ratify the second 13th Amendment. Yes. Thank <laughs> so, you. That's correct. Just throwing that out yeah. there as we end. <laughs> so, Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Reg. It's been wonderful having you. Thank, Thank you, you to our much. audience for tuning in. This is a wonderful program. And I wish you all a good evening. Mm -hmm.